Great. So welcome everyone once one more time. Today we are here exactly around the roundtable discussion on how to put your DBA thesis together and show the actual knowledge of all the knowledge that exactly characterizes a, a DBA thesis. Um, basically, let me first introduce Dr. Tab and myself. Dr. Tab is an online mentoring community. And what we do is basically we support uh, doctoral students by providing relevant relevant information on what to do next and how to do it quickly. My name is Anna Faria. I am one of the Dr. Tab co-founders. Um, just briefly about myself, I have a business and economics background. I'm very much interested in re any research that is related to sustainability, to behavioral change, to uh, behavioral economics. So everything that deals exactly with the humans uh, and how, how we behave and adapt to different uh, situations. Um, today, and let me see why my dear, all right, I think I have here a small issue with my, with my dear presentation, which we'll fix now. Uh, am I still sharing? No, or you're not. Enough? You're yeah, still not. sharing. Yeah, my my external monitor played some some tricks on me. And now, perfect, perfect. Oh, okay. perfect. So now, uh, for today, we exactly want to give you an overview of the main chapters of uh, uh, the EBA thesis and actually uh, a thesis in, in general, to highlight exactly the relevance of the recommendation chapter within uh, a DBA thesis, and to discuss what factors are to consider when exactly filtering your ideas and recommendations, and in particular related to this conclusion uh, chapter. I'm not alone today. I'm. I'm I will shortly also introduce uh, the remaining panelists, starting with the ladies first. Uh, so Dr. Inia Bongo Uzuru, um, she gra recently graduated from Liverpool University. Um, within Doctorate Hub, uh, she is exactly a local and special interest coach, and she's doing a great, wonderful job as a, a club founder and moderator to the African Club. So basically the African Club, and I'm sure Ini would be able to share a bit more, you know, I saw Ini welcomes all students that are both from Africa, from African countries studying abroad, or also at national universities, but I'm sure she will be developing this further. Um, next, we have Dr. Farhad, and I'm not sure I can tell, spell out your- <laughs> Just your use sermon. the first part, after is fine. <laughs> After this time, it means sunshine. Uh, <laughs> so you graduated from the IA France University School of Management in France. Um, as well, Farhad is, is one of our local and special interests uh, coaches. Uh, later, we also will introduce uh, a number of workshops that exactly Farhad is, is also developing as a follow-up from this roundtable discussion. And last but not least, we have Dr. Andreas Meisner, which is one of our co-founders, basically. Um, based on his experience of, shall I say, around above 500 students, he has been a major contributor to the Doctor Hub community in terms of the development of courses, webinars, uh, workshops. He's one of our journey mentors. And for those, I'm sorry to say that I at the proposal development stage, you will meet him exactly at, at the club that is that he founded and is moderator of. And um, to allow also, since this is a, a, a very unique topic that mixes a bit the academic interest, research interest also with the professional backgrounds, I will invite now also the the panelists to, to tell a bit more about themselves and starting again with Ini. Ini, please. So be so kind exactly to tell about a bit more about yourself, if you wish. Um, well, yeah. I... <laughs> Yes, good afternoon, good morning, whatever part of the world you are. Good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm actually based in Nigeria, Abuja, Nigeria. And as Anna has said, I'm a recent, um, actually I finished in 2021, but had my face-to-face -face graduation on July 29th. Having said that, I also want to actually give kudos to Doctorate Hub 
because uh, during my journey, it was that um, platform by which I was no longer alone and I had several sources that I could go to to help me on my journey. Having done that and happily um, graduating successfully, um, it behoved on me naturally to also want to support others. And that's why I did not have to think twice to um, join Doctorate Hub on the flank of the African Club in uh, trying to provide support, the necessary support for similar doctoral candidates and um, postdoctoral on their postdoctoral journey. Um, it's been a quite enjoyable experience. And personally, I keep learning every day. I've gone further now to try to understand and put my name in that space by trying to see if I can publish my work and identify that niche of mine, which I'll be able to take it another step further. And like I've been discussing with Anna Andreas and others on Doctorate Hub, it's a completely new experience. So we learn every day. I was quite happy to be invited here this afternoon to just give my own small knowledge as it can be to what it takes to writing your thesis and providing actionable knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for exactly taking your time to, to be here today. Yeah. Farhat, the floor is yours. <clears throat> um, so, my name is Farhad, uh, Swiss national and researcher, and uh, originally from Iran. Um, I did, I um, I did my bachelor's in in economics, business, and uh, law, and then master in business administration, and later uh, doctorate in um, in management. Now I've been mentoring students since my master's, which was more than 20 years ago or roughly 20 years ago. And now I'm fortunate enough to, to do um, academic supervision and, and mentoring for more than 50 students uh, with my former universities. And um, also fortunate enough to, to be somehow uh, collaborating with uh, Dr. Top. Um, now, how I came uh, across Dr. Hop is very interesting. Uh, once I finished, my thesis, uh, I reached out uh, to different academic providers just to see, you know, just to get a second sort of opinion on, on my work. Obviously, every school or university has its own uh, academic uh, faculty, but I really wanted to uh, have some sort of um, uh, quality standard by, by, by soliciting the opinion of uh, other scholars. So um, Dr. Top was very kind enough to establish Zoom meetings and, uh, and, and I was fortunate enough to speak to several uh, um, uh, mentors and uh, gain their valuable uh, uh, feedback. Now, um, post that, I submitted my work, did my viva, and uh, uh, the results were summa cum laude. Not, it, not that it counts, but I think once you spend so much time on a project and time and money on a project, I think it's worth the <laughs> additional quality control. And I think personally that there's a great value add uh, uh, towards uh, the mentoring activity. And then um, I guess, after that, uh, I, I, you know, this sparked uh, a, a lot of joy uh, uh, for for uh, passing on uh, the the experience and the knowledge to other students, and I'm fortunate enough to be collaborating now with Dr. Hub. Now, my experience with this topic is that you know I started to write uh, the methodology chapter, which is very straightforward because you know he takes some sort of Grid, and then uh, uh, you 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 write your methodology, and and then you do also the literature research, which for me was a big headache because there is no end to to what has been published, right? So, and then uh, once you do your research and present your 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 findings, 
you sort of think it's finished, right? So <laughs> you think, you know, all is done, but I guess the toughest part is actually ahead of us, right? So uh, the chapter five, and this is something that a lot of people ignore is that many faculty members at the panel during the Viva, they just read the introduction to see how you break down from a real world question to your research aims and objectives and research questions. And then they flip to the last chapter to see what is the conclusion, how you address the, the, the questions. And, and this is from the academic perspective, this is how they read your thesis. And more importantly, the practitioners who have unfortunately not a lot of respect for academia, they just care about the recommendations. So the answer to the, so what? Right, so they want to see the implications, not the academic implications, how you change your uh, edit uh, uh, theory. They want to know what your research can change in their day-to-day -day work, right? So that's why I think, and this makes the DBA so special because it's a industry PhD, that is, you know, many people show up at this chapter with a list of, 10, 20 recommendations. To me, that is very immature to present your recommendations. And I think the art of this chapter lays in the maturity of your recommendations, because at the end of the day, you wanna boil down the recommendations to three actions, right? That your, 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 the, the management can do or whoever the stakeholder or, or of, of, of this research is. And, you know, coming up with different sort of criteria and coming up with a, some sort of infographic or a grid that is practical and simple. And that was one of the questions I think that was posted. You know, how do you present your, your, your research? And, and, and that needs some proper thinking in order to come up with sort of different filters to, to bring down your recommendations to let's say three actions, depending who you're presenting to. Is it top management? Is it middle management? Is it the team leader? Is it concerning with a lot of investment, time, practicality, originality, all, all that. So that's why we thought, you know, it would be um, very helpful to, to guide students uh, on, on this topic in order to be practical and achieve the goal of a DBA, because at the end of the day, you're there to fix a real world problem. Very well, and you have already, there's some also provocative sentences and statements that I will definitely pick up later. So last but not least, and exactly before I also move to the last panelist, let me also just introduce one thing, you know, like this is a recorded session. Uh, nevertheless, you are, or what means nevertheless, you are more than invited to share all of your questions that you have along to, during the session. You know, like, please just raise your hand and mute yourself or use the chat room. I'm, I'm happy to read those questions loud if required. Uh, if there's something a bit more sensitive or that you perceive that you exactly don't want to be recorded, at the end of the session, we typically switch the recording off and then exactly all of the panelists will be available to answer all of those, all of those questions. So let me now give the floor to my dear co-founder that he can exactly tell a bit more about himself. Yeah, well, I, I make it quick. So I, I was introduced with a 500 and yeah, I worked with 500 students and above at the University of Liverpool's management school, DBA students that is. So I, I got a crash course and how research perhaps works or what are the common problems that research students face. And um, I was invited by several of them to, to train them in, in a number of novel ways. And this is how the doctorate have came to life. Um, so this is a very short version. And since then, we worked with many students here at the doctorate hub and advanced on how we do that. And I think this is all of my background. And with this, let me loop already to what Farhad said. I think it's important to have those different perspectives 
and to know they are different readers um, of your CSS, right? And obviously, if you if you are at the point of graduation, the most important reader for you will be the examiner or examiners and what they get out of there. So um, the thesis must be fine-tuned for that. Uh, once you once you're good on that, then comes the second group, and it's not an unrelated group because as Farhad said, now you must boil down the findings and present them in a relevant way, and you must also have them well derived from the data you present and from the analytics and from the methodologies used and from the literature that you brought into and from the initial problem framed. So you see, we cover all of the different chapters of a thesis. Um, so it's all interrelated. And only if you master that, um, then you might become one of those unicorns. And today I met, I think it's the second or third only. So after 10 years, having only known like one, two, three students who went through the Viva and just got the degree, out of more than a thousand, so you can imagine uh, how difficult that will be. And with this, I close my introduction. All right, and I think that since Farhat um, exactly started already unveiling a bit of, of, of what a DBA thesis is all about, I perhaps would invite you exactly to, to share your experience on how how was it to exactly put the DBA thesis together and how have you dealt with exactly this, this last conclusion chapter, uh, what, what would you like to share on that end? So, <clears throat> I guess, you know, my, uh, my thinking on this thesis is, you know, you can, you can spend a minimum three years delivering a paper to achieve uh, title, <laughs> which is, which was originally my approach. I just wanted to, you know, um, step up my knowledge, obviously, but then again, you know, we know that, you know, having a, a, a title helps, but I think in hindsight, it is a very sad motivation to do a thesis. I think, you know, um, ideally, you want to have fun while you're studying because you know it's the highest level of education and it's usually very very difficult in terms of time uh, lifestyle management to you know deliver i don't know 150 to 300 to 400 pages so i think before you know one of the advices that i would give myself is you know and and i did that you know by by having these affirmations writing on written everywhere saying you are doing this for yourself and you should enjoy this this journey and uh, so what i want to say is it is important to deliver the best you can while you're studying uh, uh, or, or researching at, at, a, at a phd or dba level so in that sense it is and it's a uh, unfortunately you, you you never finish a proper research meaning by the time, this is a funny one. One of the recommendations I give to students before the Viva is read what has been published since you finished writing. <laughs> so, because it's constantly changing. And this is what the supervisors do. They just look up and see what is the latest on your research. And you're lagging behind already your, uh, while you're becoming an expert, you're already six months behind because you haven't been reading the latest research on your topic. So that's the funny part. Uh, so yeah, I think a good research never ends and it's worth spending quality time uh, uh, um, uh, while you do your research. So that's why I think, you know, getting third party opinion, similar to when you go to a doctor, you know, when you have sickness, it's always good because uh, your faculty, they have their own sort of surrounding or expertise and once you spend three years on a, on a research topic, I think it's worth it to, to see uh, or, or level off the standard of your research to just more than your university by, by teasing other people's opinion and see the valuable uh, uh, recommendations of other, other um, uh, faculty members. And, and this was what 
absolutely convinced me with Dr. Todd because first of all, I absolutely respected the, the, the quality of the advice I received. Um, second, I highly appreciated the level of time and commitment that was given to me. It was not just, uh, you know, it was genuine. And, uh, and it helped me a lot to, to gain a different perspective towards my research. So, uh, and, and this is actually where I see the value added of, of, of such a platform. So, yeah. Um, how was your uh, thesis exactly? No, like how is a, a thesis typically structured from the university you, you graduated? Yeah, so from? it's interesting uh, because as Andreas uh, often says, um, every university has its own sort of approach towards the thesis. And we had many, many discussions regarding what is the right way to do it. So. The ultimate recommendation is follow your school's recommendation, right? So if they want to have four chapters, that's it. If it's five chapters, that's it. And every supervisor has his own or her own sort of uh, expectations towards the thesis. So first advice is follow your university. Second, see what the supervisor is saying. Based on my experience, typically, a thesis has five chapters, four to five chapters. There is the introduction where you, you know, talk about the context of your research, see where is the, you know, real world problem, break it down into your aims and objectives and research questions you want to address, you want to frame your question. And then you go into chapter two, which is literature research. And you just look into literature and see what has been done before me, because you're not the first and the last person, this, this doctoral uh, approach has been there since more than 150 years so you know you're not going to reinvent the wheel and I say that again and again because many students they reinvent the wheel by by writing a thesis with 17 chapters and you know it doesn't make sense so typically a second chapter is literature what has been done before me right and if you're lucky and and most of the time this happens um, some questions you can answer through reading the literature. You know, you're not the first one asking these questions. And uh, there are people, scholars and researchers who have been addressing this before. And then chapter three is what justifies this research is the methodology because not all questions can be typically answered just with the literature research. So in chapter three, you, you lay out the foundation of doing your research. So what type of research? What's your philosophy in terms of as a researcher? Um, your worldview, are you a, do you believe everybody has a different perspective? Or, you know, if, if are you a quantitative person? Do you think numbers will reflect the reality and so on and so forth? And then the methodology is typically ended with your data collection and analysis. And then I think, the, so for me, methodology is a very straightforward chapter. It's probably the easiest one and the easiest one to start the thesis with because it's straightforward. Uh, there's nothing to be invented. You just apply whatever methodology and justify what you're doing. Um, so typically I start with methodology and then go to literature review and then you, you present your findings, which is very straightforward. It's more like he said, she said, but obviously very relevant uh, 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 for your research because you want to base all the implications on your findings. Now findings can be from primary research or secondary research, meaning literature. And then comes the tough part, which is the conclusions, right? So the last chapter, this is, this is where you put everything together. And this needs proper, proper time and proper reflection. And I think this is what makes a good thesis. Um, you know, the level of thinking you have, you have put into your research project. And here, I think, again, similar to a painting, you need to do this on several layers, meaning you need, personally, I think a mature thesis is, is one with higher level of abstraction, meaning you have done the initial thinking, but then you, you do, you reflect upon your thinking and critically, 
So I think it's a different level of abstraction that is required. So what you do here is basically you relate your findings to the literature. And what is important is, is, is to have a theoretical or a theoretical or conceptual framework uh, which sort of relates your work to the to the literature, right? So it's a visualization of of your work, which is also a very, very, very important chapter. You know, how to come up with some sort of visualization of, of theory and your project. Uh, and it was, I think, one of the questions on the on the chat room, you know, how do I approach presentation of my work, right? What what is the ultimate goal? So I think personally, I would recommend three things uh, that are very important. One is to have an overview of your research, sort of a mind map, but not you know a drawn map, man, mind map, an academic mind map, which shows you know starting from the real world issues and the context of your research to the research uh, uh, aims and objectives, and 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 visualizes sort of your methodology and your solutions basically on one page, right? So this is my research. Uh, this is your guideline. This is your mind map that you can hang on and, and think about if it, you know, just to summarize everything you're doing from the beginning to end. The second piece of advice I would give is to have a wonderful conceptual framework, meaning, you know, a visualization of everything that is out there in terms of theory and in terms of your work, your findings, you know, to visualize that one. And then finally, and this to me, it's the most important part. How do you present your recommendations, right? Uh, I think a very simple way would be, I have following my research, I have 25 recommendations. I doubt anyone is going to read 25 recommendations. And I doubt that anyone is going to listen to 25 recommendations, right? So, um, and that one is basically the, 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 the part that is practical and it's important for your career because, you know, nobody cares how many years you have spent to obtain your DBA or PhD. I think what they care is, so what, right? So what is the implications? What did you find out? How are you going to change the world, right? So I think <clears throat> you need to have a, a, a complex structure to filter all your recommendations based on different criteria. And this depends obviously on your stakeholders, on your, uh, um, on your resources in terms of time, money, on, on practicality, on, on, on originality. There are many factors you can envision to, to, to filter all those recommendations to come up with three recommendations. And I think, you know, I mentioned the research overview, you need a elevator speech, speech for, for, for your work. I mean, again, what are you doing? Tell me in, 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 in a one minute pitch. And this is also a typical questions that they bring up in, in the Viva, you know, tell me what you have been doing in one minute or in three minutes or in five minutes up to two hours, right? So you have to be able to boil down everything you have done. And one of the recommendations I give to my students is summarize everything in one sentence. And this becomes very difficult, right? So, so you have to bring, what was the problem? What did I do? And so what, right? So I think all these abstractions um, require intellectual work. And for the intellectual work, sometimes, or not sometimes, all the times, you need third-party opinion. Somebody who comes from, with a fresh you know, mind and looks at what you have been doing and, and some guidance. And, and to me, I think a quality of a good work is, 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 is proofread by different people. So typically, you know, this is the process of peer research, right? So peer review, meaning this is how you think about it but you know some, can somebody else understand what you're doing and and a funny ex experience that i had on was i used to hate the the workshops uh, at the university because random people would randomly criticize you with random topics 
And, you know, I used to get really upset and, and angry and thinking, you know, you have no clue about my industry. <laughs> I've been working so many years as a senior director and, you know, like puffing up myself and thinking, you have no clue. But I understood the importance of this peer challenge, you know, because finally, when I started to embrace all these feedbacks, this is when I started to evolve as a, as a researcher, meaning everybody can criticize your work, right? And everybody's opinion is very valid. So obviously I was very focused on my supervisors because they were my bosses. And, you know, I cared a lot about their feedback because they were the scholars. But I think, you know, especially if you are doing an executive DBA, when you're working with people who, are, who have managerial experience, you know, these are very smart and, uh, and achieved individuals. So the more feedback you receive, the better you can defend your work, right? And, 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 and that's why I think, you know, having access to several supervisors outside your sort of school makes, uh, uh, makes your research bulletproof. And I think it's a luxury to have, I mean, I was very surprised to see the quality of the, uh, the academics uh, at, at Dr. Top to see how much time they spend to understand what I have done to, to, to before giving my, me, me feedback for, for the one-to-one. -one. So I really like this approach and that's why I feel I'm very privileged to be associated and to collaborate with you uh, because I think there is a real value add for the students, um, especially because you, you know, we are not part of the, your faculty. We are not going to judge you. And I, I think having a, a third party uh, who, who gives you well-meant feedback is always helpful. And you know, I was very much scared always to have stupid questions uh, towards uh, my supervisors because you know, they're constantly reviewing you um, during these three to four years of uh, your, your, your research. And by the time, that's also funny, by the time you submit your research, I think the, the, the mark is given already because, you know, they had a quality three, four years time to judge you <laughs> by seeing how you evolve. And I remember one of my professors during, during the Viva took out his booklet and quoted me from my, you know, three years ago on my first workshop. And I was like, oh my God, you know, like, and he said, yeah, in your first workshop, you, 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 you came up with this question and now I have the privilege to listen how you solve the problem. So it's beautiful, uh, but I'm saying a lot of people, and, and that was also one of my problems. I, I didn't want to give the wrong impression. So it was always, you know, pressure on to to be to be smart and i think if you want to be a real student you have to be able to ask you know simple questions maybe not to direct it to the faculty because sometimes it creates the wrong impression but you know having this luxury to 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 reach out to other supervisors and, and discuss your thinking is i think is amazing and considering and that was also a big topic for me you know, when you're spending so much money and time on your thesis, it's a big investment. You better get the best out of it. So, you know, having, you know, spending $100, $100 on a coaching or workshop is nothing compared to the tens of thousands of, that you're spending. And more, more, more importantly, I'm, 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 I hate to talk about money, but I think it's the time you spend I personally think you should get the maximum out of it, right? So not only from your intellectual capabilities, but also reach out and get more input, right? To get a, because it's probably the last time you spend so much time on, on, on any project, right? Definitely, definitely. Ine, is there anything exactly you would like to add at this point in time before I pass it to Andres and then back to you on the next one? Okay, no, um... Actually, was it anyway I, different to you with you, basically? 
Yes, um, I'm going to be talking basically from the UOL point of view. And um, I've, our focus was on action research, where we were expected to produce local knowledge. And that's, um, we had to identify a work-based problem. And the choice of action research was because we're trying to improve practice. We're not trying to generate any form of theory. And this uh, involved extensive collaboration between myself as a researcher and then participants in my organization in my data gathering. It really definitely was an approach where one was able to encourage organizational learning because it's only during the learning process that we were able to generate practical end results. And I'm focusing on this because of the nature of asking us how to show how and put the DBA pieces together for actionable knowledge. Now, actionable knowledge is all about practical end results. And um, this, in my own case, was done through an adaptable spiral practice where we had to go through the cycle of constructing the problem, planning, we then take action, then stand back and evaluate the results of what happened there and then, and then key that back into, this, into the research process and iterative process. Now, in terms of the chapters themselves, my thesis in particular had, um, well, I think I had about six chapters, but immediately after the introduction was the methodology. And that was because based on the design of my research, I had to, you know, get information from the organization before now taking that identified problem back to literature for me to now identify with what I'm seeing in the organization, what does literature have to say about it? And then from there, now took the findings with the research questions that came up from the research, from literature review. And then I now went on and on to go into the system with two cycles, two action research cycles, and then later on with the discussion and uh, conclusion. But like we said, actionable knowledge in terms of what I was in yeah, my research, you know, it was all about looking at the three voices. First and foremost was how did I change as a person, which was my first person learning. And then during the stage of in getting information, data gathering from the organization, that was the second person learning because I'm not getting the voices of the participants with the problem that I had identified. And then last but not the least, which is, act, which is actually the actionable knowledge is what, what am I able, to, what, uh, which learning can I as can be transferred to be applicable to other organizations? In terms of my thesis, what's the dissemination of the findings to a broader audience? And um, like we're saying, all this is on, all this focuses on how do you want to put this information across? And just like Fahad has said, you, you learn so much from you know, sharing your findings, having others read your work, going to like doctorate hub to discuss what you have, your challenges. You know, all this is we or you now trying to improve your learning, expand your knowledge. You know, you want to add to the body of knowledge. So you want to know what's already existing with this problem I have, has it been done someplace else? Or is there something else that can be added? And generally in a nutshell, the ultimate goal of the research, the, from the UL perspective, but the whole um, goal of our research was to develop actionable knowledge. In my own case, I was focused on the lack of adoption of a, 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 a system in my organization. And I was able to come up with a model. And just like we were saying, while you're trying to write your thesis, you must be sure of the lens in which you want to apply. Why? Because if the lens of your research is found faulty during your viva, there is no ground for foundation on which you stand on the findings that come up. So, you know, like we always say, when the part of the support I give on my African club, 
you definitely must be able to defend because anybody can get any result with the same problem, but it's your choice, it's your design, it's your approach. And that's the most important thing. You must be able to stand on your choice, which, de which determines your conceptual framework and how you go about it. And with that, I think I will allow other questions to come, but basically actionable knowledge is all about you being able to present practical end results that can be transmitted to a similar organization. Thank you so much. Perfect. Andreas, would you like to also share some thoughts before we exactly address the questions that are coming into the chat? I can briefly run through. I had to smile though once once far talked about time. Once a student told me uh, my first literature review took me a year and it wasn't good. Um, so time is relative, right? Um, if, if you if you have someone with whom to work and that job can be done in a month, then certainly you will have saved time and on the right track. But more, moreover, Fahad put forward five points on which I quickly want to reflect. The first two are actually of relevance to any, or perhaps all of the five are of relevance to any work. So don't be inventive. Yes, um, I would second that. Uh, it's it's a research project is actually quite boring if you know how research works and you just need to follow the protocol. So what, what you're really expected here is to learn how to conduct research and how to use your brain to be critical and analytical. So that's the first point. The second is research never finishes. Your research never finishes. And actually that's true on both of the ends. Um, you didn't start the research, you started your research project, but the topic was researched before. So at the end of the day, you need to, first of all, you need to bring in all of the knowledge that comes before, not only from the literature, but also in partition, in particular, if we talk about DBA research, what you observed already in the past. So those is data that is to be called on. And at the end of the day, you need to call the shots. So what are the boundaries uh, that you establish for your research project? Where's the start and the end? Then I had to smile to the chapter two methodology. Um, who worked long enough um, in DBA programs knows that there are, there are certain expectations and that, well, if a program expects you to have a chapter on the methodology as chapter two, then you are not in a doctoral program, but as a matter of fact, you are in a master program because you are expected to follow the protocol. Research is you build on related research. So um, if the research problem is not asking for the methodology to be introduced first, you can't do that. Um, and there we come now to the most tricky thing, politics in research, which uh, Farhad also said, you're on the fair side if you follow what the faculty expects then you're on the fair safe side so go that way that's true but unfortunately next to the faculty there's a supervisor and the supervisor might have a very different view to the faculty because that's how academia works yes everyone critics everyone and, and nobody so are, agrees with each other exactly so already we have two sides and then there comes the third side which is the examiners right so you need to keep three sides happy so how do you do that well don't invent, right? We had that before. Because if you do not invent, you work over related research. If you work over related research, you play the ball further. You don't like my approach, go to Smith, who is highly cited and who in nature published that and that worked out well, that methodology. And so, okay. so this is something that's very well ex accepted in research, having different views but letting the other go if the other can stand their ground, right? You have evidence, you are credible in your work. And that's also what Fahd said, how is it? And that's now the next point. How do you present your findings? First point, how do you present your findings, right? So exactly, credible all of that way. And then there comes the other very important, um, as Fahad said, and he said many important things, summarize your, your findings in, in one sentence. It's the same I ask my students at the beginning of the cycle once they are, it's a research problem. Summarize a problem in one sentence. Usually that won't work out at that stage. But if you're in the examination and the examiner says, can you briefly introduce your research? Then the worst thing that you could be doing is take more than two minutes to do that. And unfortunately, most of the times that I see that that's happening and I'm sitting there like that. 
waiting for that moment where I can cut in not being unpolite and say, thanks, but stop, right? So don't make me looking like that. Or if you see another one looking like that, understand that's not a happy smile, okay? So, and with this we come to, come to the fifth, which is exactly the peer challenge, right? We talked about it's critical. You might not like it to be critic, in particular if you're from the business world. Hey, I'm here a manager. I know how that works. Yeah, no, you might know how that works in your business, but you're here in academia. Things work different. We critic each other. And we do that not because I don't like that. I mean, you can't also do that, I believe, but no, we would do that over data and evidence, right? And we make arguments out of that. And we do the point, get the point or not. So those are the five follow-ons um, in summary on what Far had introduced and what I picked on that. Ball back. Um, may I, or is, is there somebody else? No, no, exactly. I think we have quite some questions. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I wrote them should... down. I wrote them down, and I want to talk about them. So we had one great question uh, uh, regarding challenges, right? So and it was one of my favorite topics because, <laughs> because the thesis is full of challenges, right? So, and uh, there is no proper research without proper challenges, right? So, and I think, and this is a topic that brings a lot of passion to me because at, at, on one side, you're expected to go and present a perfect sort of research and defend all your choices and, uh, justify why you did what you did and uh, sort of say, you know, this is the best way to do it and that's it and come up with some random future research rec uh, recommendations that somebody else can do to enhance somehow your research, but still your research is perfect. I think um, a good researcher knows his limitations or her limitations, meaning in terms of um, methodology, obviously, you know, no method is perfect. So that's one thing. And then, you know, I think you should be quite honest in terms of, you know, what kind of challenges you, 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 you came across. And I remember I, I dedicated a lot of, uh, uh, resources to this topic and, uh, you know, it gives an impression of, you know, uh, uh, you had many, a lot of challenges, but I think it's, it's just a quality of a good researcher to be very open and honest and, and transparent. Now, um, I think the question uh, we had exactly. in the That's chat what was, I was going to challenge is yeah. when it comes to gaining yeah, yeah. access, access yeah, yeah, yeah. to the organizations data. for the data collection. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I can give you just because you asked me, you know, what is my opinion? I did it, I had specifically five uh, challenges that I had to overcome. Um, I think one main topic was, you know, private source of information, right? So um, some data or, or clients, uh, not client, but company specific, and they don't like it ending up uh, in a, it's a random library with millions of people having access to it, right? So because you know, uh, they talk about strategy and this is, you know, what, what, what lo academia loves, internal source of data, right? So because they don't see it and, and you are the practitioner who has access to it. So getting access to that is, is a tough one. So in my, you know, some cases, and I think, you know, industry related PhDs are, are the, you know, it's the latest development of PhDs or this D DBA. It's very practical. You're working in an organization. You're working on a specific problem of the industry. So, and I, you know, there are some, some, some executives that actually take a project and make it a, you know, thesis, which is wonderful. Meaning they, they influence, and I have a couple of students like this, what, you know, they, they take a company problem, they work on it and everybody's aware of it, right? So the company knows that you're sort of an internal consultant fixing their problem. So in that case, there's no problem having access to, to private sources. But if you're there to criticize your industry, if you're critical towards, you know, in my case, I, you know, I, I was, you know, talking about short-sightedness of, you know, 
CEOs, uh, you know, profit orientation of public companies. You can't really, you know, quote uh, the CEO and and let them know <laughs> what you're doing. So yeah. So and then also, uh, the, the, how the, have the, you managed exactly to overcome that? How have you managed to have access to the the, the people that you needed to collect your data, basically? If so, if exactly can yeah, share yeah. that this public. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, also there are also companies which have as part of the company policy that you cannot share your opinion. And that was also one problem I had interviewees where the company would say, no, you don't talk to sort of media, which is also sort of public, right? And then, uh, so how did I overcome it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can ask the university to keep your uh, thesis sort of secret, meaning not public, right? So this is my solution to, so that's because what it's quite, is. Yeah, yeah, it's quite more private, to have access yeah. to the people you needed to talk yeah, to who opted yeah, to have exactly. I mean, everything is anonymized, but still, you know, you're talking about very sensitive topics, which is in my case was come, you know, company strategy, which is you know, trade secret, right? So, so the private source and company policies is one area of challenge, and then client confidentiality. Obviously, if you're talking, you know, to clients, we had a question regarding. Uh, uh, regarding uh, surveys, right? So you want to keep respect the individual's rights to, you know, keep their. There is also a whole chapter on 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 privacy uh, 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 when you do research. So client confidentiality is a big point um, when you cite them, uh, so that nobody can know who's actually behind uh, this this this. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously you should know, but you know. Uh, yeah. Not everybody else. I Data don't know quality. Exactly also, to cut you short, but I think we are we are slightly running, you know, like uh, getting in like to the one hour. So if you don't mind, I also would love to pass it the ball to to Inif to exactly that's something that she also faced in terms of gaining access to to the organizations for data collection. If there is any insightful tip that exactly to be provided. Uh, no, actually, in my own case, in particular, because I was an insider researcher, those are part of the things that were already in consideration when one was uh, thinking of the ethics of it all. You know, you had to consider um, who you were going to be asking questions from. You know, basically, it was part of those things that were taken into consideration before even arriving at using so the actual research problem. methodology yes okay. so okay. there were those things that were already put in place and considered so there really were not much as challenges in my own case okay okay so we have here exactly one do you want them to unmute yourself i assume this is still related to this question correct we Deb? yes it is yes i i just wanted um with respect to being an insider um in your company um, how how did you address potential biases? Um, um, of course, having knowledge of your com of, of the company already, how did you how how did you address um, that aspect of? Um, of I think the the best way to to address that is is triangulation. So peer review and 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 you know because you know we are fully fully uh, trapped in our own world, right? So that's why I think, you know, getting different perspectives on your work is so helpful. So in my case, I, I, I worked with peer researchers and, and, you know, in every step I was doing, I was challenging myself by, you know, even from coding, you know, how, how you code to, to how you show your results. So peer research uh, triangulation is awesome just to, to, to be challenged by other academics uh, uh, on, on what you're doing to, to you know, to cap, you know, to reduce this, these biases that, you know, and there are a bunch of biases that you come across. And again, also in methodology, you should, you should address this, this part uh, very carefully, how you, you know, cl close your, 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 your mental gaps, you know, things that you don't know that you don't know, or things that you know that you don't know. Very important question, yeah. Yeah, and the only also some I uh, sorry, Ine, exactly. I wanted to, to pass the ball shortly to Andreas because he also commented okay. on the show. Okay, no, that's a, that's no, no, okay. for, no, go ahead, please. No, that's okay. No, no, no. Um, I want just wanted to say that the 
the challenge I encountered more was rather like in the role ambiguity where at one point in time, I'm wearing the hat of the researcher. At another point in time, you know, I then have to be the manager in the organization and, you know, just trying to let the, the participants understand that um, whatever they say is uh, gonna be anonymized and not held against them in terms of their, could it be promotion or whatever, or uh, their, their um, evaluation later on in the year and all that. But um, since it was already, since I already had an idea of the challenges that, um, well, that um, would come up, it was a case of me dividing and knowing that the, at this point in time, this is the hat I'm wearing. And the second time I'm exchanging it to wear this hat. So it's something that I, as a person, I knowingly went into and I was able to, you know, um, when taking my decisions or evaluations on actions I've taken, I, I, I wrote this down in, the, in, the, in my research so that it was known. And then another one was, of course, the organizational politics, which one cannot rule out in trying to get to what you're getting and all that. But basically, um, once you're able to identify ahead of time challenges that could come up, it gives you room to plan on how to work um, ethically within this um, realm. Thank you. I think that this is exactly a very interesting topic, potentially for another, you know, like roundtable discussion, exactly how uh, to make sure you have the access to the people you need to 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 answer your surveys, your 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 interviews, and I think that also now it, with Andreas, I would ask him exactly to kind of sum up at least this this uh, question and potentially also related to these two other ones we have on the chat room when it comes to the fear of collecting data, um, and then understand exactly there is nothing interesting which. I assume can be easily related to exactly where the gap is and what is that is being researched. So I, um, I leave the, I leave the hottest ones for you. I, Anna, before we pass to Andres, I just want to quickly address one more question we had in the chat regarding. Uh, and we will come back. Exactly. I'm just trying to oh, yeah? wrap up exactly okay, all okay, of these perfect. ones, and then we come back to to follow perfect, up shortly perfect. on the, also the others. Perfect. Andreas, yes, are you there? Yeah, exactly. Yes, I, I am there, but I don't have that much to add, except perhaps um, that generalizable, transferable, uh, what is my role as a researcher? How do I BA my... Now, there's a, the one thing that you look at the results at the first, second, and third person, um, which is, by the end of the day, not much different than economist work once they look at the macro, meso, and micro level. So third person results um, as perhaps a macro level, like what do my results tell in general? Then comes the my meso level, but let's first go to the micro level. So it's me, first person, me or, the, or my team or my organization, depending what we are doing or looking at here. So what is directly actionable what can I do? What can my team do? What can my organizations do? And then comes the meso level, which is everything that relates to me. Now, if I'm in a big organization, it might be teams of teams. So what can we do here? Or if I'm running a company, it might be um, other companies or um, everyone with whom I'm in business contact. What can we do together? So what's, that's the actionability at the different levels. So first, second, third level. Or if you want to look at other literature, Marco, Meso, Micro level, but tells by the end the same thing. That's it. Okay. And exactly for the question around the, the identifying the researchable gap, I just posted within this chat room exactly the, the link to the doctoral thesis research proposal development club and potentially ex exactly invite those that are at this stage and that are are, are, are dealing with still um, finding, uh, identifying a, a problem that could be researched to, to join the club and, and the, the, the sessions. Um, now, on the, the question of uh, exactly this difference on the, on the transferable, actionable knowledge, uh, that was also uh, another question that was posted. Um, is there, uh, Andres, you want perhaps verbalize because exactly the chat room is not available afterwards, so. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I, give the, I give the ball back to Fahad. Okay. <laughs> yeah, what, you know, um, um, there were two questions that, that, that are very good and, and I come across them 
a lot. <laughs> one is the tough one and, and a broad one, which is about how to write a thesis. Uh, so, you know, we can spend 15 hours on that. Um, but typically, you know, if I had to give an elevator speech, what I suggest, you know, uh, uh, obviously do your research in terms of context of why you're doing this, uh, this research. And that goes into introduction typically. So this is what you do when you are, you know, in the beginning stage of your research. And then um, methodology is very straightforward. There's a right and wrong how to do the methodology chapter. So, and it's a very important chapter because this is the area which where the school teaches you to become a researcher, right? They can actually teach you that. And that's probably the only thing that the university can teach you to become a researcher, how to do research. So that's very straightforward, very important in terms, you know, in, in any sort of marking of any university you see, methodology has a, has a big portion of, 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 the, of the mark, uh, of the quality of your work. Um, literature research, again, uh, there are different ways to do it. Uh, and for me, I think it's very tough because, you know, you, you, you need to frame the time, the time zone, you know, how, how much, how long do you want to do the research? How far back do you want to go? You know, <laughs> so if you want to keep it, you know, up to date, you go back 10 years or 20 years, or if you're using um, industry reports, you know, 10 years is very old. So you want to look at the last three years, uh, what has been published. So that's, I think it's important. And then if you want to do a systematic one or narrative uh, literature research, that's up to you. And then uh, findings chapter is super easy and very slim. Because again, it's he said, she said, and how relevant are those uh, uh, verbatims, the quotes that you bring? Um, because you're going to use them uh, later uh, to answer your research questions. Then, typically, the last chapter and the first chapter are the last parts of the, the research. Because in your last chapter, you're answering the first chapter's question, right? So um, by this time, you, you should really, and this is, a little bit of retro engineering because you find, you know, during your research, you had, you had answers, but now you can put them, the questions to them in their first chapter and say, listen, this is what I want to find out because these are the things that you found out. So the, 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 uh, um, the first chapter uh, introduction is, is, is very straightforward. Also, there's, you know, there's a, there's a uh, um, sort of a structure to that, what you need to put in, in, in first chapter. And the last chapter, I think is the most important one. Again, conclusion where you bind everything together. You don't say anything new there. You just show how you're answering the questions. You talk about the limitation of your research and then implications, you know, in terms of practical implications, those are your recommendations and theoretical implications, meaning, you know, there is, there's a wonderful quote that I read in one of the articles. There is no research without theory. So anything you did, you know, you either confirmed or denied or, or enhanced something related to theory. So there, there is going to be uh, um, um, academic implications to your work because otherwise it wouldn't be academic what you're doing because you use some sort of theory to, you know, in, in your framework or whatever. So. Uh, theoretical implications, and then, you know, future research very straightforward because you can say everything that, you know, my research has limitations and in the future people can address them. So, you know, in terms of other regions or, or other type of uh, methodology. So all, all that is very straightforward. And then summary also very, very important. And, and, and that's the chapter that you rewrite and rewrite and rewrite to make it more and more and more con condensed. And, uh, and uh, that's it. And in terms of references, I think the minimum amount, you should at least have 100 references. I personally think the more references you have, the better it is. And in terms of mixture of references, you want to have academic references. You want to have, and I'm, I'm specifically talking for a DBA, so a business-related uh, 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 thesis. So you want to have academic re uh, uh, references. You want to have industry references. Those are you know, industry reports. And you want to have uh, scholarly references, meaning, you know, theses and PhDs that you use to read, uh, you know, what has been done before. So I think in terms of breakdown, 80% should come at least from academia, 70 to 
and then you plug in 30 to 40 percent of of, of uh, relevant industry reports in terms of citations uh, in order to be very relevant uh, uh, as a thesis and then page number i guess something you know if you are depending on what kind of methodology you're using obviously a quantitative research is less paper heavy than than qualitative you know a quantity research if you're a genius you can do it with uh, 100 pages and again i think uh, we were having this discussion about references yeah if you're a nobel prize winner you can have two references that's possible but probably none of us are so you know you need to show case the fact that you have read a lot because you want to be an expert on that topic and then um so in terms of page numbers really 100 is the minimum and then towards up depending if you're doing a phd or dba i think some universities are 150 pages i i, I think it's very safe to, to write 150 to 200 obviously on the top side you can write as much as you want but then again you know always think who's going to read it right so that's what i would say and then the second question that I really liked also was about research gap. So a uh, very important topic. Um, first of all, um, that was also a broad question. Um, I think a research gap justifies a thesis, right? So meaning that's why you're doing your thesis because there is a gap. So it, it's a very important justification for your thesis. Now, research gaps um, come typically in literature. So when you read about your topic in the literature, there is always a, a sort of a paragraph talking about the research gaps. And when you read also about future research, and, uh, and those recommendations are also around research gaps, meaning future research can close research gaps. And, and this is a good place for any researcher to justify their topic. I mean, if you don't know where to start, read some articles about your topic and see what kind of research gaps researchers are talking about, right? And you can pick some of them and try to address them with your research. So I think it's a very, very important question, research gap. And, and every research should at least, personally, I think, should at least address one to three, not at least one to three, but at least three research gaps, I think you know to justify why you're spending three years of research you know you, you you better close some research gaps you know what i mean and exactly thank you farhat and before exactly we go either to the last questions or to last thoughts during this webinar in is there anything else that exactly would like to add to 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 at this point and in the meantime if you have like a last round of questions please share because exactly we are we could spend here like two or three hours definitely but we are coming exactly we are already above one hour so just please uh, uh, post them into the chat room so any any last thoughts any last no, no, my, my last uh, thoughts is just to tell everybody that's here who's a doctoral student or pre-doctoral as the case may be, that it's a, it's, it's a long journey, winding, hard work, it, 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 it demands hard work. However, everybody can get to the finish line. And when you definitely get there, there's a very satisfying feeling. So do not relent, do not give up. Thank you. Thank you, Ine. Correct. Anna? Andrea, yes? I think there, there was this question regarding the last question in the chat is, uh, are there some uh, I, I will workshops? exactly come. I, I'm not ignoring yeah. that question. I'll, I will come to that one at the end. Awesome. No worry. <laughs> I'm exactly just finalizing and wrapping up any, any exactly any uh, additional awesome. comment or, or, or anything. Andreas? Yeah, well, let me just um, very briefly pick one word, re-engineering, and I think this is what, what Fahad said, and that says it all. At the end of the day, you know much better what you did, how it looks, how it fits together, so put the final structure of your thesis in this light together. Does it need four chapters, five chapters, six chapters? Uh, where do I... How do I present the data? Do I need to present the data in a way that I first analyze it in itself? Or can I just do it against the literature immediately? So those are two different things. Does it need to be shown or not? 
and then exactly where do you do the analytics do you do you do that together with data presentation or do you move that a bit into your own chapter or entirely into your own chapter or do you put a bit in the three chapters data presentation analytics conclusion so this is just cosmetics and engineering as Farhad said so don't spend too much time at the beginning like how many chapters do I want to add no you know what a research must cover right six points must be covered and those six points will be spread over any number of chapters in my case it was over a number of 13 chapters because I had to repeat things so that was research not done that well but re-engineered in a very nice way that it fit that's it okay Farhad before I I wrap it up any additional thing comments all right, and then before I basically switch off the recording. Okay, so if you have that burning question that you do, did not want to have uh, recorded, please bear with us. Let me also just answer exactly one of the questions that was at the post. Um, we are at Dr. Tab exec. We are we are uh, um, always listening to 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 you. Basically, and as part of this, exactly, we often have during our webinars, exactly, the, the request for follow-up uh, workshops and exactly where, where people could, students could work out specific topics. And as a continuation, exactly, as, as a follow-up of today's webinar, uh, exactly, Fahad uh, offered himself to, to, to host two webinars with slightly different nuances. The first one is exactly more of a, a two hours talk where exactly he will share some, some, some knowledge on how to, to, to get your thesis together and exactly how to move further. And the, the second one is, and I'm apologizing now because I exact the dates are actually not correct. So it, it's, it's, it's the week after the 10th. Um, it, this one is already a more like personalized so where you will have the chance of discussing your own research in particular in a, in, in, in a session with Farhad together afterwards with with a group discussion so I invite you exactly to um, to visit our workshop page we will be within the next weeks um, in, in enhancing increasing the offer of workshops exactly at, uh, on a variety of topics uh, if there are exactly also any questions, um, you have your uh, mic. Yeah. Uh, no. can, yes. can I Sorry. add something? I think personally, what I like about doc, Dr. Tab is the fact that you have so many scholars, right? So mm -hmm. I think the students should be able to, you know, have the one on ones with any any of the coaches, right? So, and you have. And that's exactly where I was coming. More than, exactly, I was more coming than, exactly you know, to that. So I will yeah. close this, this uh, round table exactly uh, how I should have perhaps started by telling you that, you know, like I'm not only the co founder, but the kind of the go to person if you exactly need a, a special advice or if you want to reach out to one of our mentors of our coaches you have here my email so don't uh, don't be shy exactly just drop me a line tell me exactly where you are what are you exactly uh, needing and i'm i will put you forward exactly the resources content people that exactly can provide you the support you are looking for at that specific moment and with this, let me exactly just shortly check if there are any questions at the forum. Uh, and since they are not, I will now stop the recording. All of those that exactly would wish to ask a question to any of our panelists, feel free to do so afterwards.